Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Aren't you always glad when the Sabbath shows up? Yes, sir. I'm serious. Yes, sir. Absolutely. It's a blessed day full of blessings. Yes, sir. It's a holy day, a sacred day. And uh, I always welcome it. Amen. It, uh, it changes everything. Yeah. Your health starts changing. Your relationship with your Creator starts changing. Yeah. It's a blessed It day. is. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Are you ready for the Word? Yes, sir. Turn to Colossians 2 and 2 Peter 3. Amen. Last week I said that we sometimes have to Look at passages again and again yes, because sir. studying the truth can be like trying to drive a screw into a hard place. And you run the screw in as far as you can and then you back it out and you run it in again and you back it out and you run it in again until you can hub it up. After the service last week, Myron walked up to me and said, I think I heard that screw go. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got it in there, he said. Well, I think we did too. But there are other screws. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's not just one. There are other screws. So we're going to go back to our text from last week, and both of them, and we're going to look at them again. Colossians 2, verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come. Does that say future tense? Is that, is that future tense? Yes. yes. So there's still shadows in uh, the Moedim, in the feast, that are shadows of things to come. The body is of the Messiah. But uh, all of them haven't been fulfilled yet. Right, right, right. Some of them have precisely. If, yes. If some of them have precisely, what does that tell you about the other ones? They will be. They well. will be too. So we need to know everything we can about these feasts. Yes, sir. Because they also teach us about who? The Messiah. The Messiah. Right. Verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of Yahweh. And again, let's read our passage in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 15. An account that the long suffering of our Messiah is salvation even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which, in which some of the things Paul wrote, are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, W-R-E-S-T, Rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Let me just quickly remind you that the word translated rest there is strebloo, and it literally means to torture something, it means to put it on a rack and to twist it completely out of joint. Uh, and that is precisely what we see being done in our day and time with the uh, things that that Paul wrote, people torture it. Yep. They twist it completely out of joint. They do. Uh, Peter said the unlearned strebloo, what Paul wrote. The root word for strebloo is strepho, which means to reverse it or to twist it. And that's what we see happening. They reverse and twist uh, Paul's writing. Well, the Holy Spirit warned us through Peter that there would be men who are unlearned. And what does that mean, unlearned? Does it mean they don't have a diploma from a seminary? Yes. No, That's not what it means. What does it mean? Uh -huh. Exactly. If, if Peter's telling you somebody's unlearned, he means they don't understand anything about Torah. Right. 
If they understood Torah, they wouldn't be twisting Paul's words the way they have twisted them. So he says that there are men who are unlearned who will take things that Paul wrote and stretch them out of joint. They would twist his words and even reverse his words. They would make him say the very opposite of what he was right. actually saying. Now, right. the Holy Spirit, through Peter, warned us yes, that that would take place. Yes, sir. And the very thing Peter warned us about takes place every week in right. American pulpits because Peter's warning gets completely ignored. Right. Preachers are using Paul's writings to teach that you do not have to keep the law anymore. They're using Paul's writings to teach that you don't have to keep the Sabbath, the feast, the dietary laws, or to be concerned really with anything that is written in Torah. Those are the very preachers the Holy Spirit used Peter to warn us about. And when I say that, when I say there are preachers out there that, that are twisting Paul's words, when I say that there are preachers out there who uh, are actually lying, when I or anyone takes the scriptures and points out that, that preachers and teachers twist Paul's words and are teaching false doctrine, the overwhelming response is not, wow, thank you for showing me that. Yeah. That's right. yeah. The overwhelming response is usually, who are you to judge? That's right. yeah. Which means... I really like my preacher and I like my church, so shut up and leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, that's what it means. That's what it means. Yeah. Several months ago, Marie posted an article on Facebook warning about how a very popular preacher in America today is deceiving the masses. Someone who thinks they are really someone mm -hmm. chastised her for doing so. And the reason he gave for his chastisement was, one, who are you to judge? And two, we should be focused on more serious issues. Pretty well, serious. <laughs> there is no issue more serious right. than multitudes being led into hell right. by preachers who have deceived them into believing lies. Right. Okay. And as to the question, who are we to judge? Well, we're simply the people who actually read our Bibles right. and are now echoing the warnings that are in it. We're not making them up. Right. They're there. The They're Bible there. is the one warning us about these false teachers and preachers. Yes, sir. So how can you be judging when you say, hey, the Bible warned us about a preacher like this. Right. The Bible warned us there would be teachers like yes, this. Sir. How can you be accused of judging as if that's a bad thing if you're just saying, hey, I read in the Bible that if a teacher or preacher is teaching and preaching this, they're a false teacher and preacher and we ought not be listening to it. Right. Amen. It's absurd, isn't it? Yes, sir. How, uh, it's intriguing how the devil can sometimes twist people's minds so that they no longer even make sense. There's right. nothing logical in, right. in their protest. How foolish do we have to be to ignore the instruction given to us in these two passages about how false teachers and preachers will work. Listen again to Peter's warning and exhortation in verse 17. He literally pleads with anyone who will listen to him to beware of men who having no understanding of Torah go around twisting the writings of Paul to make them say what they want them to say. Verse 17, you therefore beloved Seeing you know these things before, beware, lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Mm -hmm. Here, we're backing that screw out again. The error of the wicked. The word error comes from the word plane, and plane means fraudulent. And if you look it up in any Greek dictionary, it will tell you it is it, it's a fraud. It is anything that strays from orthodoxy. Well, what would be the standard that would be considered to be orthodox? Torah. Torah. So anything that strays from Torah is fraudulent. Right. So in, in, when he uses the word error here, he is saying that if somebody is saying something, teaching something, preaching something, 
and it contradicts what's written in Torah, what they're teaching and preaching is a fraud, right. is fraudulent, right. and shouldn't be listened to. Yes. That's, it's an error. Right. I, I like what the guy said on the, the uh, DVD we watched. It, it was just really profound. We, we all, I know I did, growing up in the church I grew up in, and, and you probably too, we were taught that sin was doing what? Missing mm -hmm. the mark. But nobody ever told us what the mark was. Right, right. Torah is the mark. Yes, sir. It is. That's the mark. Yes, sir. And that's the reason, you know, John goes on to tell us that the transgression of Torah, transgression of the law, is what sin is. Right. That's missing the mark. Yes, sir. Well, error then, when it talks about error, error means that I aimed at something and missed, missed it. it. Yeah. It, it's that which is fraudulent. The error of the wicked, this word translated wicked, uh, literally means those who are lawless. So is he concerned with somebody that's driving 63 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone? No. He's talking about the law of Yahweh. Yes, sir. So the fraudulence of those who don't keep the law. Peter's warning us by the Holy Spirit, do not fall victim to people who are trying to teach you and lead you, and the things they are teaching you are outside of Torah and teaching you to be lawless. Don't become lawless like them. Don't right. fall victim to this error of lawlessness. lawlessness. Peter warns us to not let men who stray from the teachings of Torah lead us into lifestyles that are devoid of the law of Yahweh. Amen. The standard is Torah. Yes, sir. Say it again. Yes, the standard is Torah. Amen. If you eliminate it, then every man does that which is right in his own eyes. Right. Can we not see that? All around us. Absolutely. And the standard is Messiah. Yes, sir. Those two things do not. Uh, what, what's the word? I, I do one Deviate. Th those two. Well. When I say the standard is Torah and I say the standard is Messiah, I'm saying the same thing. Right, yeah, right. right. Yeah. So the, they complement one another. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the standard is Torah, and the standard is the Messiah. And he walked in perfect obedience yes. to Torah. Yes, he did. And here's what the Scripture says concerning that, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. As you have therefore received the Messiah, Yeshua, the Master, so walk ye in him. Amen. Paul's writing to Gentiles who are being led to believe that they can be saved by grace, but they don't have to keep Torah. Mm -hmm. Let me say it again. Mm -hmm. Paul is writing to Gentiles who are being led to believe that they can be saved by grace, but they don't have to keep Torah. Wow. And it could be confusing. So he's giving this simple instruction to them. If you receive him, you should walk in him. Yes, sir. He's the standard. Yes, he is. Don't let, don't let some slick-tongued preacher deceive you into thinking that you can receive him and live a different way. He is the standard. He is the example. Then Paul issues the, the, the warning that we looked at last week. His warning was never against Torah or about Torah or about the law. His warning was always about men. Right. He never yes. warned anybody about, well, you don't need to keep the law. No, he's always warning about men that would deceive you and beguile you. Yes, sir. Receive the Messiah and walk in him and then listen to this warning. Verse 18. Colossians 2, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands have nourishment ministered and knit together and increases with the increase of Yahweh. Now I'm not going to go back over every word in this passage again like we did last week. But I do want to remind you of what you discover when you take the time to look those words up. Yeah. You discover that Paul is warning us to not let men elevate themselves to places of authority in our lives 
so that we begin to trust them instead of trusting what's written in the Scripture. Right. Here's the breakdown. Paul warned that we should not voluntarily submit ourselves to the authority of men who will tell us what we can and cannot follow in the Bible. He says to do that is to worship angels. Is that what it says? That's what it says. Well, let's go back over that for a minute. Any of you ever been tempted to worship an angel? No. Sir. no. Any of you ever had an angel come to you and, and appear and or read of an angel coming to you and appear and, and saying to somebody, you, you really need to be worshiping me? No, sir. If it was, it was a bad angel. That's right. That's right. The good ones, when people fall down before them, what do they do? Yeah. Stand up. Yeah. Don't want to be worshiped. Right. right. And so then we went to Luke chapter 7. I've talked about that. We went to Luke chapter 7, and we saw that John the Baptist's disciples were called, they came to Messiah as angeloses, which meant they were messengers. Right. And then after Messiah dealt with John the Baptist's, Baptist's, that's an interesting <laughs> way of word. After John the Baptizer's <laughs> disciples, which were messengers, he dealt with those messengers and sent them away, then he turned around and announced to the crowd that John the Baptist himself was a angelos. Right. A messenger of Yahweh, right. sent by Yahweh. So we saw that the word angelos can refer to a heavenly messenger, or it can refer to a human messenger. Yes, sir. The context dictates it. Right. So here in Colossians chapter 2, Paul is warning us not to voluntarily, with joy, submit ourselves to men right. Right? who will dictate what we can and can't have out of Torah. Right. He said, to the worshiping of angeloses. So do you think he's talking about a heavenly messenger? No, sir. Or an earthly messenger. Earthly messenger. Exactly. So it's the worship of messengers, teachers, and preachers. And when you, when you mention that, I don't care who you're talking to, where, where you're talking. If you mention that, everybody would protest and say, I do not worship my preacher. And they'd be offended and angry if you accuse them of such. But the point Paul's making is that whoever you obey, right. that's who you worship. Right. That is it. If you trust what your preacher says more than what's written in the book, yeah. I don't care how much you protest. Right. If you trust what he says more than you trust what you can read with your own eyes in the Holy Scriptures, you're worshiping him, not Yahweh. Right. right. Amen. Yahweh wrote the book. Yes, sir. To obey it is to worship him. Right. Yeah. To obey somebody who tells you you can ignore, ignore what's written in the book means that you worship them instead of right. Yahweh. Yeah. Any preacher that says you don't have to keep the Sabbath, you don't have to keep the feast, you can eat whatever you want now, and, and, and you believe him and follow his instructions instead of the clear instructions of Scripture, you're, you are worshiping the messenger. Right. Yeah. And that's what Paul and Peter were warning us against. Yes, sir. People don't mean to. It's not like they walk in saying, now that's somebody I can worship. They don't mean to. Right. They don't want to. They want to serve Yahweh. They want to serve the Messiah. But they get deceived into rebelling against Yahweh and the Messiah by being taught to reject what Yahweh said and how Messiah lived. They don't mean to rebel against Yahweh. You understand? They yes. don't mean to. Right. But they, they walk in without their guard up. Yeah. And they get deceived into believing teache, teachings that sound convincing. And because they believe those teachings, they find themselves holding to those teachings and rejecting what's written. Yeah. And as a result of that, they are in conflict with Yahweh and worshiping a preacher, a teacher, yeah. a messenger. 
They find themselves putting more faith in what they are told than in what is written. And when you do that, you're worshiping the messenger. Well, knowing that there are preachers and teachers who twist the writings of Paul as they do other scripture, and they're leading people away from truth, and knowing that there are people who are being led away from truth, there are two things I want to cover. I want to uh, talk about what makes a false teacher teach falsely. There are false teachers that teach falsely. It will help us to understand what makes them do that. Right. And the second thing that we're going to talk about is why do people go to and follow these false teachers? Yeah. If we understand that, then it helps with the being delivered from it. We're not going to talk about both of those today. We're just going to talk about the first one today. Yeah. Next week, when we gather, we'll talk about uh, why do people go to and follow those false teachers. Today, what makes a false teacher teach falsely? First of all, let me define what a false prophet, preacher, teacher is. A false prophet, preacher, teacher is anyone who contradicts what Yahweh said. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's the simplest definition I can give. That's... It doesn't need to be more complicated. No, sir. If they contradict what's written, then they're a false, right. fraudulent preacher or teacher or prophet. That they can be very cunning at how they do this. They will usually use one part of Scripture to get you to disregard another part of Scripture. But know this, no matter how cleverly they make their case and no matter how seemingly brilliant they are or seem to be, as they explain to you why you no longer have to obey what is written in Torah, when they reject Torah, when they reject Torah, they are contradicting Yahweh. And that makes them a false prophet and a false teacher. Yes, sir. It's as simple as this. When, when somebody stands in the pulpit and they say, every day is hope. Yeah. That sounds good. It does sound good. And it's easy to say, man, yeah, he's right. I'm going to be spiritual. Every day's hope. But Yahweh said, the seventh day yes, sir. is holy, right. set apart, sacred, different than all the rest. Right. So even though you can sound real holy by saying every day, I, I think every day is holy, you just contradicted Yahweh. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Yahweh blessed the seventh day. Right. He said, remember the Sabbath day and keep it, that seventh day, keep it holy. Keep it separate from yes, all sir. So anytime, I don't care how brilliant they sound or how spiritual they sound, when they contradict what's written, then they are a false teacher or prophet. Let me, uh, why don't you turn there? Jeremiah chapter 13, excuse me, Jeremiah 14. And put something uh, in Jeremiah 14 because we'll come back to it later. Jeremiah Yahweh used Jeremiah to say a lot about false teachers, preachers, false prophets. He gives us great insight into how that whole thing works. But I just want to read one verse. Jeremiah 14, 14. Let me, do, let me give you the context of this. Yahweh spoke of a judgment that was coming upon the, the people. And Jeremiah protested and said, Yahweh, it's not their fault. They're being told lies. Yeah. And Yahweh acknowledged they're being told lies. And he's going, what we're going to read is what he said about these people that are lying. He had no use for the fact they were lying. But he also said, well, the people who are believing the lies, judgment's still coming. Yeah. They shouldn't have believed the lies. They should have a love for the truth. If they had a love for the truth, then, then they wouldn't have fallen, fallen victim to this. But listen to what Yahweh, Yahweh acknowledged to Jeremiah, yes, they're being lied to. And here's what he said about those liars. Then Yahweh said unto me, the prophets prophesy lies. What's the next phrase? In my name. In my name. You bet you they're lying. And they're doing it in my name. They're, they're telling people lies and telling people that that's what I said. They're lying to people and telling them that that's how I feel. They're lying to people and telling them that's how, that that's how I see things. Now, folks, you're going to lie on, you're gonna lie on me. You're going to get me mad. Right. 
If I lied on you, you'd get mad. Yes, sir. But you go lying on Yahweh? <coughs> they prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not. Neither have I commanded them, neither spoke unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their own heart. Understand that every false prophet comes in the name of Yahweh and his son. Yeah. Wow. Somebody who is outside of this, uh, they're just pagan. Right. But when somebody comes into the people of Yahweh and starts doing this, they're and doing it in his name, that's what makes them a false yes. prophet. Every false prophet comes in the name of Yahweh and his son. They were not sent by him, but they will try to get you to believe they were. They will come in his name. They will say he said. They will say he told me. They will use what he wrote to twist certain things and make you believe that other things don't matter anymore. Right. It is our responsibility to be able to discern whom Yahweh really sent and whom he did not send. You see that in verse 14? They prophesy lies in my name. So there are going to be those who Yahweh did send that are going to speak in his name. There's going to be those that Yahweh says, I did not send them. Right. But they're going to stand up and say, Yahweh sent me, and they're going to also prophesy. Right. It's up to us to discern which one of them is the true prophet. Yes, sir. We have to figure that out. And Yahweh said the first and the only indicator you need is to be able to recognize a lie. The prophecy, the prophets prophesy lies. They are saying things that contradict me, Yahweh said. You got that? Yes, sir. If they say something that contradicts me, they're lying. If they're lying, they're a lying prophet. Right. Very simple. That's not complicated, no, is sir. it? sir. Again, let's go back and take the, the Sabbath, for example. Yahweh said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. They say... We don't have to keep the Sabbath. Mm. Yahweh said, the seventh day is holy. They say, every day is holy. Yahweh said, it is a statute forever. They say, well, it changed at the resurrection. Wow. Well, somebody's lying. Right. <laughs> right. And it's not Yahweh. <laughs> you got that? Yes, sir. Somebody's lying. Right. Yes. If he's, Yahweh's saying something here, and they're saying something here, somebody's lying. And it makes me even nervous to present it that way, but it, it, I'm just trying to, right. to shake us. Right. It's not Yahweh lying. Right. My. It should be simple to figure out who is lying. When you can hold a Bible in your hand. Right. When you, when you, when you got the hard copy, when you got digital copies, when you got cell phones, when you got tablets, when you got computers, it should be easy to figure out who's lying. Yes, sir. Anyone who contradicts Yahweh is a false prophet and a false teacher, false preacher. Well, what makes a false teacher teach falsely? Two major things. There may be a lot of subcategories under this, and we could break it down a lot of different ways, but there are two major reasons that false teachers teach falsely. Number one, ignorance. Yeah. yeah. Go back to Colossians 2. Look at verse 18 again. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. Listen to this. Intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Do you see that warning from Paul? People are joyfully submitting themselves to men who are preventing them from having the rewards of Torah. They are even worshiping these messengers who Paul said intrude into things that they have not seen. Here's what that means. They invade with hostility and they speak in great detail. That's what that word intrude means. They speak in great detail about things they don't understand. But they're so vainly puffed up in their own fleshly minds, it doesn't bother them they don't understand it. They'll still talk about it for an hour. 
Right. Right. I mean, these people that preach against the Sabbath will use 24 verses that say, remember the Sabbath, and then tell you, well, we don't have to. Yeah. Right. So, so they're giving great detail about things that they don't even understand. They think they're wise. Vainly puffed up in their own minds. They have degrees, and they speak with great conviction as if they know what they're talking about. But they're ignorant. You remember what Peter said about men who twist the writings of Paul and other scripture? He said they were unlearned. Well, what he meant by that is they're ignorant. Right. Yeah. That's what ignorant means is to be unlearned. They just don't know. But that doesn't make them innocent. Right. Because Peter also said, 2 Peter 2, 5, he said they are willingly ignorant. Mm -hmm. Many times, willingly ignorant. Sometimes they don't know because they don't want to know. And if you want to do an interesting word study, go look that word willingly up. If I write out a will, what have I written out? My desire. I am determined that at my passing, this, 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 and this will be done. Right. When I step from this life to the next life, this is my will. I am determining right now, writing it down, signing my name to it. I have determined that I want these things done. Right. 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 Well, when Peter said that these people are willingly ignorant, what he meant by that, and you look that word up, it means they're determined to be ignorant. Wow. They put great effort into it. Wow. Hmm. If you are determined to know things, you can know them. But if you don't want to know certain things, you have to be determined not to know them. Yeah. Come, on. Yeah. Come on. How many folks have you talked to about the Sabbath and they say, whoa, whoa, I don't, I don't want to know. Yeah. Yeah. How many people have you talked to about Christmas and they say, oh, I, I don't want to know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You start talking about Easter and it freaks people out. Yeah. They don't want to know. No, no, don't tell me. No, 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 no. Right. They are determined to stay ignorant as if they think ignorance will keep them safe. Right. Yeah. Innocent. But it doesn't. Let's say that uh, you're a preacher or a teacher who preaches or teaches every week. And every week you read the Bible to prepare to preach and teach. And let's say that you're, you were taught that the law passed away and that we don't have to keep it any longer. Let's say you were taught that we are able to worship on Sunday now and, and not on the Sabbath and that you can eat bacon because Yahweh changed his mind on that thing. Mm. And that the feasts are just empty shadows that you can ignore since the Messiah came. You were taught that and so that's what you teach. Yeah. But every week you read your Bible to prepare to teach and preach. And you find things that contradict what you were taught, right. contradict what you believe, contradict even actually what you're teaching. Right. You read about the Sabbath and you find words like perpetual, yeah. everlasting. Yeah. Well, if you continue year after year to preach against it, you have to determine in your heart yeah. to be ignorant of what you're reading. Right. Yes, sir. You can't read words like that and be accidentally ignorant. Right, right. It has to be something you do on purpose. Mm. Some people are ignorant because they've never read it for themselves. And so they just teach what they're taught. They buy sermon books and they use Sunday school books and they just teach what they're taught. But some are ignorant because they were very determined to be ignorant. They even went to universities and seminaries to get degrees that would make them look right and feel better about being ignorant. Yeah. I'm serious. Yeah. 
I, I, I've got a, a, a master's degree and a doctorate degree in my ignorance. Wow. I had somebody with a PhD teach me that the law passed away. And now I have a PhD and I can teach you that the law passed away. Wow. You have to be very determined to stay ignorant. Now, whether they are just ignorant or willingly, determinedly ignorant, it doesn't really matter. Neither one makes them innocent. Right. If a person is going to speak for Yahweh, he must first know what Yahweh said, and he must always agree with Yahweh, or else he can't speak for Yahweh. Right. Yahweh doesn't need people running around the earth correcting him. Right. Right. I know Yahweh said this way back when, but he didn't realize how things were going to change. And so we really need to alter some of this. Wow. Y'all wait doesn't need folks running run around doing that. Yeah. So, so if a person speaks anything that contradicts Yahweh, then he's lied and that makes him a false teacher. Right. Immediately, he's false. Right. So ignorance makes false teachers teach falsely. The second thing that makes them teach falsely is covetousness. Yeah. Look, look back in 2 Peter chapter 2. Verse 1, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Now, when you start pointing that out, you're not judging. You're just acknowledging what right. Scripture said. Right. Peter said there's going to be false teachers among you. And here's what they do. They privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying, and that word there means contradicting, contradicting the master that bought them and bring upon themselves with swift destruction. Messiah said not one jot or tittle shall pass from the law. Right. If you say the law passed away, you just contradicted him. Right. Verse 2. Many shall follow their pernicious ways, even though they're false teachers, contradicting the Messiah, many follow them. Not a few, but many. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. They're so good at their jobs that when people actually read the truth, they think the truth is false. Right. Verse 3, and through, say that word out loud, covetousness. covetousness, shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingers not, and their damnation slumbers not. They're going to get what they deserve, is what Peter said. It's coming. Judgment's coming. You can't do this and, and, and get by with it. Wow. Look down at verse 15. Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Besor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Wow. Covetousness is an eager desire for more. Here's where, when, when I say false teachers do what they do, because of covetousness, here's where most people get fooled and taken in by false teachers. They hear that, well, I, what makes a false teacher do what he does is covetousness. Well, I know that my teacher or preacher can't be a false teacher or preacher because they're not covetous. Uh, that they think it's easy to spot the false teacher because he's always telling you that the way for you to receive the blessing of Yahweh is to give him your money. To partner with him. Right. Give me your money, partner with me, and you'll get blessed by Yahweh. And they think that all false preachers and teachers do that. Well, some are blatant enough to do that, right. and some still fall for that blatant con. Right. Right. But most false preachers are not that blatant about it. And because they're not, people get taken in by them. Most people think, or they say, my, my preacher hardly ever mentions money. That's what I like about him. He hardly ever even mentions money. Well, I know he isn't cut. Or they say, my preacher isn't rich, so I know he isn't cut. Well, neither one of those two things are proof that a preacher is not a false preacher or teacher working through covetousness. Number one, you've got to realize that he's working in disguise. If he mentions money too much, you'd be on to him. Right. 
he'd blow his cover. So he has to act as if he isn't interested in your money, yeah. even though he is. Right. He's got to act as if he's not. Right. Number two, rich has nothing to do with it. Sometimes the less rich a man is, the more money means to him. Right. You don't have to be rich to serve mammon. Right, that's true. A preacher who is covetous or who loves the wages of unrighteousness, as Peter said there, isn't necessarily rich and doesn't necessarily preach on money a lot. What it means here is that his love for money dictates what he's willing to tell you. Let me say that again. His love for money will dictate what he's willing to teach and preach. Yeah. If the people he is preaching to don't want to hear about the Sabbath, he loves his job too much to try to get them to listen to teachings on the Sabbath. If the people he's teaching and preaching to don't want to hear about the Sabbath day, or the feast days or the dietary laws or really anything out of Torah. Don't, don't preach out of the Old Testament. If they don't want to hear it, he loves his job too much to teach and preach on those things. Right. In the early days when I was reading my Bible and finding things that contradicted the doctrines that were believed in the denomination that I was a part of, I went to other pastors and told them what I was seeing. I thought that if they weren't preaching it, then they must not have yet seen it. I was wrong. And I'm serious. In my naivety, naivety, in, in my whatever you want to call it, I, I was naive enough to believe that if they weren't preaching it, they must not have yet seen it. I was wrong. Without fail to the man, and I'm talking about many men, without fail, every one of them told me, you're right, but if I preach it, I will get fired too. Yeah. It didn't matter if I was talking about the sa Sabbath. It didn't matter if I was talking about dietary laws. It didn't matter. They would say, you're right. Not one of them said, no, 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 that's wrong. Here, let's sit down and study this out. You, you got off track a little bit. Let's study this out. To the man, every one of them said, you are right. But they refused to teach it because it would cost them their job. It would cost them their salary. It would cost them their retirement. It would cost them their position in the denomination. Right. Listen to Peter. They love the wages of unrighteousness. It doesn't matter if you're making $15,000 a year or $150,000 a year pastoring. Right. If you're more concerned with what they're paying you than you are in telling them the truth, you love the wages more than you love the truth. Uh, listen to me. I, I, I'm trying to help somebody. They love the wages of unrighteousness. Halloween is unrighteous. Yes, right. sir. Christmas is unrighteous. Right. Easter is unrighteous. Yes, sir. Don't care how many times you baptize them. Right. Don't care how many spiritual significant things you try to attach to them. They're unrighteous. Right. Sunday worship is unrighteous. Right. I don't care how, how much you try to make it so. It, it's not. And there is not a preacher who has two brain cells that doesn't know that. Yeah. I, I, if they've got two brain cells and spend any time studying, they know Halloween is, is unrighteous. Christmas is unrighteous. Easter is unrighteous. Sunday worship is unrighteous. They know it. Right. They all know the pagan origins of these celebrations, yet they continue to promote them. They refuse to preach against them. Why? Why would they refuse to preach against them? Cost them their job. Say again. Money maker. They love the wages of unrighteousness. You can make more money. You can make sure you secure your salary every week if you leave these things alone. Yeah. Those celebrations bring in people. 
They bring in money. They build the church. If you talk to a preacher or teacher and you say, what about the Sabbath? And they say anything other than we should be keeping it, you're listening to a false teacher or preacher. It's that simple. If you say, let, let, let me rephrase that. If they say, if you say, what about the Sabbath? And they say, well, I'm not sure. Well, how can that be? How can that be? You're not sure. Either you are willingly ignorant or you're determined to be ignorant. Right. If they say, well, we don't have to keep it anymore, what did they just do? They contradicted Yahweh. Right. So who lied? If they say the seventh day is the Sabbath, but we choose to worship on the first day, Sunday, they have revealed to you that they are covetous and love their job more than they do truth and that they are a false teacher. And we could go down the line talking about every instruction from Torah that you want to talk about. But if you say to somebody, this is what Torah say, what do you say? If they ignore it, if they contradict it, contradict it, or if they say it changed, they have revealed to you they're a false teacher and preacher. Right. Amen. They may be innocently ignorant, but that doesn't make it right. They may be willingly ignorant, and that makes it very wrong. Yes, sir. It's easy to spot the false teachers, all I'm trying to say. They contradict what's written. And they do it for two reasons. Number one, they're ignorant sometimes, determined to be so. Or two, they love the wages of unrighteousness. Let me close by going back to Jeremiah 14. Then the... Then Yahweh said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spoke unto them. Man, I ain't said a word to them. There's a reason they have to go buy books to get sermons. I'm not talking to them. That's the reason they steal their words from other preachers. But they're not getting any from me. That's the reason they're preaching gospel principles from Mayberry. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm not talking to them. Listen to what they are doing. They prophesy unto you a false vision. Strong says that Hebrew word there means a revelation. Something that is revealed. They have new revelation. Mm -hmm. And people begin to believe these revelations, these understandings that their preacher has. Well, my preacher said. Well, they start believing these revelations the preacher has instead of what's written. And Messiah said, well, you can tell whether a revelation is true revelation or false revelation. There's nothing wrong with true revelation. Right. There's something wrong with false revelation. Right. And he said, these are false revelations. Well, how can you tell if it's true or false? It's Measure it against Torah. Torah. Right. If it disagrees with Torah, that was a false revelation. Yes, sir. Number two, he said that they prophesied divination. Divination is a, a, uh, a message that is delivered for a fee. They will tell you whatever you want to hear as long as you keep paying them. Right. We don't believe that here. All right, then I won't preach that no more. Yeah. That's out. <laughs> yes. A blessing that is delivered for a fee. Mm. In other words, they're hirelings. Yeah. They won't teach and preach certain things because teaching and preaching them would cost them money, but they teach and preach on other things. Oh, you just want me to preach on marriage. I can do that. Yeah. See? And that's what they do. Yeah. Yeah. So they teach on what the husband's supposed to do and what the wife's supposed to do and how to take care of your children and how to recover from divorce. And that's all it, it ever, it becomes uh, 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 
psychotherapy. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Why? Because that's the message that's being bought. Right. Right. Divination. Yeah. I will deliver this message for a fee. You pay me every week, I'll tell you what you want to know. Mm. You understand? That's, yes, that's so. what Yahweh is saying is happening. Well, the Bible issues warning after warning. Which means we ought to be on the lookout for and beware of and deliver ourselves from false teachers and false preachers. Next week, we're going to talk about why people don't. Yeah. Why they go to and follow these false teachers. No matter how many times they're warned, most people continue to go to these places and follow these teachers. Well, there's got to be a reason why. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that. Amen. But today, what all we want to do is understand why false preachers teach falsely. Yeah. Why do they teach falsely? Number one, because they're ignorant. And if they're ignorant, you don't want to be followed. Right. Somebody's ignorant. Right. Number two, because they're covetous. Yeah. Stand up. Yeah. Let me just uh, see if I can put it in a nutshell. Yahweh warns us about them, and then in Jeremiah you read that, Yahweh makes it plain that those that follow these false teachers and false preachers will be held responsible. And the reason is that no matter how well they disguise themselves, they're easily detected. Right. It's real easy to detect them because if they're saying something that contradicts Torah, they're false. Right. Quit listening to them. Amen. Quit following them. Amen. It's Amen. false. False. <laughs> Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As his name is put upon you, so shall he bless you. And he also promises to bless our food and our water, to keep sickness from our midst and the length of our days to fulfill. We receive that, right? Yes, sir. Amen. You're dismissed. Amen.